Hi, everybody. Welcome back to History Respawn. And uh, today we are going to be doing a short stream uh, featuring our scholarly guest for our audio episode on Assassin's Creed Valhalla. So welcome back to Daniel Maleno. Hi, Daniel. Hello. So, uh, Daniel, you have been playing uh, this game on PC. I have got the PC version pulled up here, and this picks things up about 16 hours into the game. Um, and so right now I am just on the outskirts of the game's uh, version of London. Uh, so, Daniel, you had said that you haven't been to London yet, so I thought maybe we would just kind of walk around and uh, see if anything popped out to you. Yeah, so it's got the interesting thing right off the bat of like, here's our medieval huts and, and houses and stuff, and you can see in the distance some skyline. Right. Um, technically, in this time period, London, the medieval London is clustered next to or sort of by the Roman ruins. Um, so it's a separate sort of area. Obviously, now it's all just one big city. Um, so it's interesting to see that London is essentially like in London proper, mm -hmm. it looks like in the game. And before we get to the kind of city center, we can look here at the map. I mean, you've got the player character here and there's the viewpoint, uh, including the Abbey and then going to the east. And then, like you said, there's all these uh, aged Roman, decrepit Roman ruins uh, that kind of make up uh, the city center. And uh, it's kind of an interesting mixture at least from this point of the game, I, I've i really only been in settlements like the one we've just passed through, where there's kind of some uh, light palisades and wooden walls and then uh, little huts, and then not many large ruins or even a big city center like you see here with London. Yeah, and it's interesting on the map, right, that you could see some of these sites, like the Mithraeum, which you can still go and see that Mithraeum. I was actually in london last summer and a friend of mine works right by the sort of crazy office building that is built on top of the mithraeum and you can go in and like go downstairs and see it um the mithraeum is the place where the cult of mithras would sacrifice bulls and the initiates would lay under the grate and the blood would like sort of baptize them mm. so it's interesting to see it on the map here um, from what I remember, it was not an extant site in the medieval period. Um, but, you know, that's okay. There's a big old statue there. I know. I was just going to say, these are, you know, players who are unfamiliar with this game, uh, they might get the sense that, oh, well, this is just something you might see in uh, London, which was a Roman settlement. But actually, these kind of statues are just all over the countryside <laughs> in the game. It's, it's really kind of crazy. Yeah, it's hard to imagine that would have survived. Um, even just like somebody would want that in their living room, right? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's funny. This made me think actually of something though, because there was a bunch of like fruit and vegetables all scattered around. And one of the things that I thought was hilarious when you start at the game in Norway is that it's like a bleak winter, uh, like, you know, uh, dire situation, right? If you go in the water, the game actually like the, you know, Ivor says, like, be careful in the water. It's called, you know, like, um, theoretically, this is summer in Norway because it's clearly mm -hmm. summer in in England. And yet Norway is somehow, like, locked in ice. Frigid, yeah. If you go into the markets in, in the game, though, there's, like, green veg and fruit everywhere, which I thought was kind of hilarious. Like, the the image they want to give you of, of Scandinavia is ice and cold and you know the image they want to give you of england is this like rich warm summer land right so there it is yeah you're all just sort of squatting in the in the in the ruins of of giants um, right yeah and it looks like uh i i don't know what this huge structure is supposed to be i imagine it's supposed to be an aqueduct it kind of looks like it would be yeah, yeah. it's got the arches um Let's get up high here and kind of take a look. Yeah, it's an interesting thinking about like what the game has to have because it's an Assassin's Creed game. You need to be able to climb, right? That mm -hmm. was actually one of the things I was particularly interested in when they announced it. it was like, how are you going to climb? Right? <laughs> yeah, there's, um, there's not much stuff there. And 
you know, I remember in past Assassin's Creed games, uh, for instance, uh, Assassin's Creed 3, uh, which was set in uh, colonial America. And right, players yeah. were upset because they felt like, oh, there should be stuff here to climb. But, you know, in actuality, a lot of the city centers, Philadelphia, Boston at this time, you know, just they don't have large buildings. And so there was a lot of focus in that game on climbing trees. Right. That was the right. major development uh, for Assassin's Creed 3. Yeah. So it is, it's interesting how they sort of play with this, right? This is not a particularly realistic, I mean, like the map, if you look at the map, it's oh, actually, here, I'll, I'll bring this back. Yeah. It's a, it's a map of, of London, right? Like mm-hmm. you got your bridge and all that stuff, but right. Um, none of this would have been super occupied mm-hmm. during this period, mm-hmm. as far as I can remember. Um, until Vikings show up and think, Hey, that's pretty good. Um, <laughs> Maybe we should take that. Yeah. Let's take a look. Right. Let's take a look from the amphitheater here, and I'll get a better sense of the game. And I'll just go ahead and fast travel because I'm too lazy uh, to actually walk over there. <laughs> That's fair. Oh, the skill tree. <laughs> have you made sense of the skill tree? I, I, I haven't. I was hoping to show you that uh, later on or have you look at it. <laughs> uh, but here's the amphitheater. And again, I think it gives you a uh, quick sense of not only a Roman presence, uh, but then also just kind of a, a slow decay uh, after that presence. And then you've got all of these kind of major sites, including it, it does really look like an aqueduct, I would assume, because it kind yeah, of goes back into the hills. The um, but uh, just kind of a, a weird mishmash of uh, old Roman sites uh, and then collected amongst them these kind of anglo-saxon built hovels <laughs> right and i think one of the funny things is like roman cities were occupied i mean london is kind of weird but like on the continent you have lots of occupied sort of firmer former roman cities and it's hard you know like they would have used a lot of this stuff mm-hmm. this idea of these sort of like huge standing structures surrounded by hovels instead of just reusing a lot of the stonework they would have shrunk too, right? Like mm-hmm. what we see in a lot of places is that like the city shrinks down to really just the center, usually centered on a cathedral, mm-hmm. right? Most cities are essentially governmental ecclesiastical sites as opposed to what we think of as like urban centers. Mm-hmm. You know? yeah. um, right? This doesn't even have walls though. No, right? this, no. Um, yeah, not very well defended. Uh, although, you know, uh, relatively pretty uh, compared yeah. no, to I mean, the other areas I, of the game. It's interesting because I really enjoyed Assassin's Creed Odyssey. Um, I think arguably a little bit more than this, and maybe in part because I didn't have to shut my brain off as much. <laughs> Take notes, um, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I found so impressive was the way that they rebuilt the cities. Um, obviously much smaller. Yes. But, you know... That's a lot easier to do with Greece than it is with Roman Britain. Mm-hmm. Right? Just we have a much clearer sense of what Athens was like at its classical stage than what you know eighth century London was like. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting challenge. Uh, so just uh, hop over here. We talked about this a little bit, but the the skill tree uh, for this game, <laughs> which I think is interesting. I mean, you can speak more to the kind of relation of, uh, you know, the depiction of this game of you know, Norse mythology and these constellations here. But uh, from just a video game standpoint, this skill tree reminded me immediately of Skyrim. Uh, so yes, another that game that kind of options too. out uh, Norse mythology. And if, if you've played Skyrim, you'll remember the skill tree from that game included the same court of look uh, a much more organized look in Skyrim, but the same look of uh, constellations uh, and you know building a constellation through the skills uh, through uh, the skill tree. Yeah, yeah, it, I, that's immediately what my brain went to as well. Was that it was? Oh, this is a Skyrim ripoff, um, <laughs> except that it's 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 a mess. Um, I think it's purposefully supposed to be, mm-hmm. but it's an interesting decision, right? Because like each tree sends you all over the place um you know there's stealth powers in each tree you know theoretically red is melee and Mm -hmm. you know blue is ranged or whatever but like you can get you know x y or z type of stuff no matter which direction you go yeah um and it's really about those central powers 
I mean, it, it it's very strange, I think, because, um, you know, you, you don't really know, like you said, you don't really know where you're really going to get the abilities. I mean, I, I'm sure people have already posted online where all the different abilities are located, but, you know, from just me playing it without any extra guidance, it's really just kind of a guessing game as to what I'm going to get out of, you know, each turn, you know, and of course you've got all of these powers here these lines going off of this constellation, you have no idea what's next. And that can be frustrating, but also, I don't know, it's a little bit fun. Um, I don't know yeah, how I feel about it. There's an element of like emergent gameplay, right? If you mm -hmm. decide you want to go down the stealth route, you don't quite know what you're going to get next, but presumably mm -hmm. it could be interesting to find out. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I imagine most people are just going to go online and find a <laughs> tooltip. Um, I wonder how much, right, this is, is there a multiplayer aspect of the game? I don't know. And I would imagine there could eventually be one because it feels like uh, the, the the kind of rating mechanic in the game uh, would kind of lend itself to a multiplayer it, element. I don't know, but yeah, um, I don't have any news on that. It would certainly be nice if your rating party was not a bunch of NPCs who can't do anything <laughs> to a bunch of other NPCs who also don't do anything <laughs> until they meet you. Right. There's a lot of sort of like, go, my raiders, hack at each other while I run around and gather treasure. Yeah, exactly. They're the ones who take the basically take the bullets for you while you're opening up chests and you're right. trying to figure out how to uh, to get around obstacles in the surrounding area. So yeah. making sure not to hit any monks on the head. Oh, of course. Yes. <laughs> uh, although I, I haven't <laughs> watched. I don't know if the NPCs actually kill monks or do they avoid it as well I, I haven't i haven't noticed i didn't notice either that would be interesting to see um, this poor poor sacrosanct monks <laughs> uh so this is uh the settlement uh that you create uh ravensthrope and this is uh my raiding party here you can see all of my viking crew coming off of the longship and uh you know we've all got uh matching color it's like a, a uniform <laughs> right here I, yeah. I would i would doubt that that's historically accurate uh but I, everybody is very well dressed <laughs> you know every single person is in their sunday best mm -hmm. um it's fascinating i think i mentioned this in the um in the podcast but there's so many fun museum pieces just sort of scattered around in this game like if you spend your life doing viking age history and archaeology you'll be like oh that's that uh, mm -hmm. You know, everybody is wearing these very sort of like the best pieces, right? Because of course, those are the pieces that have survived, mm -hmm. um, and those are the pieces that get featured in every you know museum booklet and whatever. And so everybody's wearing all of these really nice items that you know would clearly have been only buried by the richest and most wealthy Norse people, right? But, and I was thinking that with the artifacts that you can pick up. Uh, you know, including these uh, arm rings and the rings themselves, they look like, oh, somebody, you know, in the development team went to a museum and yeah. basically copied this, uh, which is fine. I think that's that's great. It's a nice touch, but it does kind of give you the sense in the game that, you know, these objects, these objects in the game feel common. But, you know, of course, they were probably incredibly rare. Right. Exactly. Uh, here's your giant hall. Yeah. So um, I wanted to ask you about this was were these kind of halls i mean this is something that's obviously associated with the viking age uh, with viking culture but you know how common was it to have these humongous halls uh, these built are, not only in scandinavia but then also in england right i mean like in scandinavia the hall is the place to be mm -hmm. um right like that is where everything happens and that's true in the anglo-saxon world as well um although not i mean these are very clearly modeled on Anglo um, Scandinavian halls, they're much bigger mm -hmm. than the actual halls would have been, uh, both horizontally and vertically, you know, like there's, there's a lot of roof space. And one theory I heard actually from somebody that I was talking to about this is that it's purely about camera stuff mm. that like, if the ceiling was too low, you wouldn't be able to get good camera angles. But these are like, the fact that you arrive at Ravensthorpe, which is not yet Ravensthorpe, and this hall is already here <laughs> and it's got these incredible decorations and mm -hmm. this incredible woodwork. Like who built this? <laughs> How did they do this in a year? Yeah. Right. Um, 
the great heathen army has been around since the 860s. I don't think they had time to like, you know, hire a bunch of these look a lot like stave churches, mm. right? We don't actually know what these halls would have looked like inside technically mm. because they're not extant. Um, we have a sense of the size of them and the sort of construction of them. So like the roofs look kind of like what the roof would look like. Um, but yeah, these are very big. Um, the decorations are clearly inspired by various things. Um, but right. We don't have an extant hall like this to sort of really model. Mm -hmm. Um, and here we are. Yeah. They're just elaborate. And then of course, here's our, my favorite thing in the entire game is the map. (laughs) Um, because like you get there and, um, what's her name? Rondvi. Oh yeah. What's What is her name? Let's see. Let's speak to her. I want to see the Alliance map. Oh, well, her name did pop up, unfortunately. But yeah, here's the map. Right. She unfurls this paper map, (laughs) (laughs) this accurate paper map, right? Like, which again, we have maps from the medieval period. They don't look like this. Mm -hmm. Um, They're a lot of fun, but they're not like accurate maps. And the fact that these Norse people would have paper maps at all is, is again, not how this would have worked. Yeah. But of course, that's gameplay, right? Like you need to be able to show your player the game world and do the alliances and stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, um, all of course, the these huge stacks of paper. Uh, for yeah, scrolls a, everywhere. A non-literate society. Right. What are they doing with all this paper? Oh, yes, Ronvi here. Yeah, scribble for Ronvi. Yeah. Where did she learn to scribble? Um, <laughs> right. What's interesting because there's no rune stones, mm. which are such a hallmark of. Norse culture in general, mm-hmm. but also of the way we think of the Norse, right? Like, and it's, it strikes me as odd that they didn't like go in on the rune stones. Well, and you know, we have uh, these runes here in the inventory, uh, that in the could, game. Yeah. Yeah. That you could put into your, uh, weapons to, as power ups, but you're right. There's no, at least not that I've seen so far in the game, no mention of, uh, you know, using the rune stones for anything else. Yeah. What's interesting, right. Is that that's a very modern idea of runes, right? This idea of runic magic. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's not, it's, there's some evidence for it sort of, but like most of that is a modern creation, right? Um, this rune craft as like a power rune is a very modern idea, mm-hmm. right? Um, runes of course are another hot button topic in medievalisms because um, there's this great term uh, coined by, um, I think it's it's either the medieval middle or the medievalist. It's, there's a couple of great blogs about this sort of stuff uh, called Schrodinger's medievalisms, <laughs> where like if you see somebody with runes tattooed on them, are you about to like have a nice conversation with like a D and D nerd, or are you going to have a conversation with a white supremacist? Right? Like <laughs> um, because both groups are using these now, uh-huh. right? And it's a really interesting sort of like until you actually talk to someone. You don't know what it means if they've got like the Norwegian swim team or ski team and, um, you know, the like alt-right movement in Norway are both using the same runes. Um, and again, what those runes actually meant in Norwegian Scandinavian culture would be like they're writing. They're a system for mm-hmm. writing. Mm-hmm. Um, but now we've sort of imbued them with this very mystic sense of, mm-hmm. of sort of what they're doing. So we've got the burial site out here. There's a quest attached to that. But then we've also got these uh, fantastic carved statues. And you can go through and you can uh, into your settlement. And there's these different spots where you can add uh, little uh, uh, artistic accents, let's call them, uh, to different areas of your settlement. And you can kind of put a uh, one of these amazing uh uh you know carved statues around there's one over here i think of uh odin let me get around to him yeah and again like we don't have extant wooden sculpture really Mm -hmm. because we wouldn't we have descriptions of it although those again are from christian sources right um and so it's interesting that sort of like so much of what we think of as viking is really a creation of sort of a pastiche of sort of Viking and sort of non post Viking and modern, and, you know, nobody's wearing a horned helmet in this game. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, there's that at least. Yeah. Um, but I think like even that the absence of a horned helmet is a statement, mm-hmm. right? Like um, we're not using horned helmets. This is real. Yes, exactly. Um, yeah. It's a statement of authenticity in a way. Um, or is this the shaman? 
It is, yeah. yes. So this is one of the subjects I wanted to talk to you about, but the uh, the seer character, um, and this is a character that has a pretty dramatic effect on you uh, as you are gearing up to leave Norway and you have these visions uh, featuring Odin and uh, other people from your past and your future. And uh, she's got a quest uh, for me now to go around uh, this little river here and collect uh, different... Uh, uh, different uh, objects, um, spices and uh, plants in order for her to make uh, a uh, some kind of uh, substance that I would drink in order to have another one of these visions. And right. I've been I've been putting it off. You're not ready for your trip yet. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> yeah, it's this is a really interesting because shamanism is kind of heavily debated within the context of Norse religion. Um, because, of course, shamanism is fundamentally a hallmark of the Finna or the Sami peoples who mm -hmm. are farther north, non-Germanic um, sort of native aboriginal groups. Um, and Norse culture has a really sort of complicated relationship with those groups. Um, obviously, even into the modern period, it's a very sort of there's a lot of really nasty colonial sort of stuff mm. in some in some modern Scandinavian states they are still dealing with this. Um, but even in the medieval period in the Norse uh, Viking age, there's a lot of sort of ambivalence about like what it meant to engage with these people and what magic is and who should be doing magic. Odin is weird because he does magic. Like that's one of his big things, which is typically associated with women and which is typically associated with non-Germanic groups. And yet that's his big deal. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, so it's interesting that they sort of center it so clearly and they're not basing it on a whole lot, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the seer as an idea is is really foregrounded in like, um, you know, Ragnarok. We know about Ragnarok in part because of uh, the Voluspa, the, the witch who Odin visits to get information on what's going to happen to the world. Mm. So this idea of the seer is like a is anchored in Norse mythology, but the actual stuff she does and the things she's wearing are not super based in anything. Um, again, I'll, I'll plug, there was a, an ask me anything on our ask historians um, on Assassin's Creed Valhalla and some great answers, not from me on <laughs> what the deal with the seer is and like where maybe they're getting some of this imagery because mm -hmm. she's wearing all these clothes and some of them are clearly Viking age stuff. Mm -hmm. um, I really like the fact that she's wearing coins um, because um, that was something that they actually did. Like they imported foreign coins and they would punch holes in them and use them as jewelry. Mm. So that's kind of a cool thing. But then she's also wearing like this weird headdress, which is not really based in anything. Right. And, you know, it's a very interesting pastiche of sort of real stuff and not real stuff and sort of um, things we want our Vikings to have versus things they would have actually had. Um the money is actually really funny to me because you're running around it in Norway picking up silver coins and they don't specify whose silver coins. But of course, again, not only was Scandinavia pre-literate, but they weren't minted coins yet. Oh, no um, kidding. Why? Right, like that's a, there are a few key sites where they're minting coins. None of them are in Norway. Oh, um, wow. And yet it's just silver. Oh yeah. Right? Just everywhere. Um, yeah. Sort of quote unquote silver. Uh, and they look like little coins. And it would have been really interesting to see them use hack silver, which is basically pieces of melted down silver that you could cut off and weigh. Mm -hmm. um, but they choose to go coins. And I think they probably do that in part because everybody knows what a coin is. Mm -hmm. Right. It's just shorthand for money. So, like, it's fine. But it's interesting that they sort of allied over reality in favor of familiarity. Right. Times. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. Uh, so I thought I would uh, get us on the longboat here and travel to a, a monastery. I was hoping to do a raid, but it looks like all the raids that I could do, I've already done. Um, you've raided to the, you've raided, so you can't raid I, I any have. further. And uh, there are other raids available, uh, but uh, unfortunately they're at a too high of a level, so my character would probably just be murdered. Um, but uh, <laughs> here we are uh, with our uh, longboat here, and uh, I was just wondering, what, what do you think of this depiction of the longboat and... Uh, the kind of crew that you've got on here. Yeah, so it's what's interesting, right, is we all know what the longboat is. We really want the longboat. From a from a like archaeological boat perspective, this is a great looking longboat. 
um, it's on the small side, mm -hmm. um, right? This is the sort of longboat you would be using in the beginning of the Viking Age, because I think you can hold like what conservatively twenty people here. Yeah, it looks looks closer. Less, yeah, yeah, if you could, yeah, right. maybe fifteen. Um, yeah, that's a pretty small raiding band, um, especially during this period. Like boats are getting bigger, raids are getting bigger, um, and the fact that you're doing this all with one group of dudes and women. Um, is very much, I think, about game mechanics, mm -hmm. not reality. Because at this point, what we're really talking about is like these sort of conglomerate Viking activities where lots of different groups are banding together. There's a great term for it that's being used now, hierarchy, which is this idea of like these like sea kings and these sea kingdoms that are highly malleable um, and sort of can come together and split apart. Um, and you could sort of think of like... Um, Pirates of the Caribbean, the movies mm -hmm. where like all the different pirates gather together. That's sort of what we're thinking about. Mm -hmm. um, so the boat is is a long boat. Um, it, you know, it sails a little bit high. I think that's just game physics. Um, but it looks like fun. Mm -hmm. I love that, you, that they have the songs and the, the scald is there. Um, I found it really interesting that you get to Norway from one in one of those. Uh, yeah, I think so, you have like yeah. three long boats. Yes, um, yeah. You wouldn't have sailed. You would have gone raiding. You would not have gone settling in a longboat. Oh, okay. There's a whole other type of boat, which is called a NAR, K-N-A-R-R. -R. Mm -hmm. And that's a wider boat. It's got a deck that you could put stuff in so you could actually store stuff. Um, and that's probably what you would, what most people would be leaving I Norway see. in. See, see, because um, yeah, one of the questions I had was it, it didn't make sense to me to have this ship that you traveled from Norway in. And then also being able to use that same ship in the river systems of Eastern England. That seemed a bit of a stretch to me. So it's interesting to hear you say that. Yeah. Although the river thing is actually realistic because one of the reasons why Viking boats are special is because they have this really low keel. Mm -hmm. um, so they can go on rivers and they can beach Right? You don't need a mm. harbor for them, for yeah. instance. Mm -hmm. So you could take them up rivers, and that was really shocking for most non-Viking peoples. Mm -hmm. the, one of the reasons the Vikings are able to do what they do, and again, one of the reasons why um, the victims of Vikings are so sort of like unable to make sense of it to a certain extent, they're so shocked, is because like Vikings are showing up places where nobody should be able to show up. Right. Uh, and they're getting there really quickly, and then they're leaving really, quickly. really fast. Interesting. Um, and it's because they have these boats that are really shallow keeled. Um, so you can like go up a river and then you can go onto a beach, attack, hop back in your boat, push the boat back into the water and leave. A smash and grab. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, mm. So that's sort of realistic. But again, like it's interesting that, okay, maybe they have a <sighs> long boat because they would need a long boat. But if the, you know, all the settlers are coming with them, they wouldn't be in long boats. Yeah. Right. Um, they would be in uh, these bigger, what are called NARS or CNARS. Mm. CNAR. Uh, <laughs> um, so it's an interesting pastiche because, again, when you see Vikings, what do you think? You think longboat. Yeah. Right. That is what you think. And so that's what they have to give us. Well, so it, it, even though I've completed this raid, it's given me the option to raid. So I'm, I'm, I think we might as well end this stream with a raid. Reading. It feels feels fitting. Yeah, absolutely. So this is a monastery uh, that you come across, uh, I guess, at about the 12 hour mark in the game. And of course you've got these guards all over the place. Just so many guards. And so many guards and so much violence. <laughs> and just really grotesque amounts of gore. But you know, I think that fits in part and parcel with modern games and uh, with Assassin's Creed, especially in the last uh, decade or so. And then, of course, you come raiding in and all of these people, the local civilians, hightail it back and try to run away. Right. And your goal is basically to grab a couple of chests. Yeah. Um, it's very schematic in that way. Mm -hmm. Which, so it again, makes sense, right? Like, to a certain extent, you can't have an open-ended raid and you're not going to be allowed to sell anybody into slavery. <laughs> um, right or ransom them off ransom, that's a mechanic yeah. that just doesn't exist um, and I think it would be a very different feel for a game if the second half of every raid was an economic transaction 
<laughs> right, like, right. A negotiation. It yeah, seems like, like we, that might be something that would work, say, in a strategy game. Like we, we had talked about Crusader Kings a little bit, right? But not necessarily in a, a game that's supposed to be about you know action and adventure. Right. It's just so, it's so funny because my prevail the prevailing image we have of the Vikings is this violence, this raiding. But so much of what you actually get when you actually like read about Vikings for a long time is that they don't actually like fighting all that much. Mm. Or, or rather that everybody wants to fight, but they would rather fight with, you know, people who can't really defend themselves. Anytime you get into a situation where there's two armies facing off against each other, you get this sense that like, this is the least positive way they wanted this to shake out. Yeah. B on both sides, Yeah. right? Nobody actually wants to risk dying in battle, despite the fact that there's all this talk about Valhalla, et cetera, you know, like, um, we see so frequently in the sources that like they'd much rather take a ransom payment mm. or they and this is true on both sides like kings would rather pay off the vikings than risk losing a battle to mm. them vikings would rather leave and go somewhere else than risk losing a battle to kings mm -hmm. you know um, not always like there's lots of moments where that breaks down but that does seem to be the sort of prevailing sense that we get Mm -hmm. um, is that like you want easy pickings you don't actually want nobody wants to die yeah um you know it's an occupational hazard but like <laughs> if you can shade things in in your direction you're going to right but that's not really a thing in this game right like there's no way to sort of like show up at a monastery and be like cart out all your gold <laughs> <laughs> well it's so weird too because you've got these characters in the game and they just seem to have such a lust for death like they keep talking about how they can't wait to to see their fellow soldiers in Valhalla and you know they're kind of looking forward to their demise and you know I just feel like I don't know you know it, it doesn't feel you know from from the perspective you just shared of you know kind of trying to avoid uh, violence and trying to take hostages that that makes more sense to me than what we get in the game yeah right I mean it's the difference between Vikings as pragmatic Mm -hmm. which I think is the ultimate, like if there's a characteristic that I associate with the Vikings, I think there's two. It's pragmatism and adaptability, um, right? Like the thing that Norse groups are really good at doing is going to places and making a home for themselves, whether that's in Russia or Ukraine or whether that's in England or Ireland or Iceland or France, right? Um, that's why one of the big movements in Viking Age history now is this idea of diaspora studies. Mm. That if we think of the Vikings as a diaspora in exactly the same way we think about the Jewish diaspora or the African diaspora, right? It really changes our sort of perspective. Mm -hmm. um, so there is violence, right? Like a category, one of the things we associate with diaspora is looking for opportunities abroad, right? Yeah. Um, for Irish people coming to America, you know, that's one thing for Norse people going to England. It looks slightly different, but it's still about opportunities abroad. So we've got um, this uh, monk that we can chase here. And of course, if you attempt to murder them, then uh, that's a no go. That's yeah, a no go. Absolutely. Yeah. But here are these uh, lovely guards that would uh, sit in. Yeah. Or They'll happily handily, <laughs> handily uh, easy to, to take out. Or usually uh -oh. they're putting up a good fight here. Um, yeah, and I, I think, oh, they took me out. I think one of the interesting things uh, that I've seen, um, let's see, reload, latest save, <clears throat> is that, you know, the game, it does kind of steer into this uh, stereotypical Viking lore of raiding and killing. Uh, but then, like you said, it does have the settlement option, which, you know, on the one hand could be, uh, you know, a kind of a way to... Oh enliven game mechanics but then also i think speaks to this uh you know uh, growing knowledge about uh, vikings and thinking of them as a diaspora rather than as just a you know a group that raids and uh, takes things from other people so i don't know it's 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 interesting to me that the game yeah kind of straddles that to a certain extent it, yeah it's it's funny right the game gives with one hand and takes with the other sometimes yes. in this sense you know, if you go to the codex, actually, mm, yeah, the description for Viking is really perfect, you know. Um, so this is a hallmark of the Assassin's Creed series um, of the codex. And it used to be the case 
uh, that these codex entries, uh, the database entries, would be really big. Uh, but now they've kind of scaled them back a little bit because of the advent of the discovery tour mode, uh, the kind of educational version of these newer games. And hopefully we'll get one of those for Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Right. This is like a, a literal textbook description of Vikings, right? <laughs> uh, you get the definition of Vikinger, uh, which I love. They do this really sort of like um, affectational, like we're going to drop all the vowels because the old Norse is Vikinger. Right. Um, but right. It's a Norse man or woman. Uh, okay, who went raiding for gaining glory both for themselves and their clan. Uh, to go a Viking was one of the most exhilarating feats of bravery. And then it notes, right, somewhat less barbaric than their initial depictions. Mm -hmm. Vikings were, in fact, part of a larger and more complex social structure, as likely to trade with another culture instead of killing them. Of course, what you can't do is play a merchant. Yeah. yeah. Uh, despite the fact that, again, and I mean, there's a certain element of that. You can sell the stuff you get, but like, Vikings and trade went hand in hand, absolutely mm. went hand in hand, mm -hmm. right? But they can't do that. I always joke with my students that like, uh, v you know, Stardew Valley Viking Age wouldn't wouldn't sell very well. <laughs> I could be wrong. Maybe it was so great. Um, you know, Animal Crossing Vikinger doesn't have quite the same appeal as like going and hitting stuff with, uh, despite the fact that most Norse people would have been farmers. Yeah, right. interesting. Yeah, and... You know, it's it's funny. You get a little bit of uh, nuance here in the second paragraph, but of course, in order to get this, you've got to come into the pause menu and then go to Codex and then scroll down here to Factions and then find this entry. So right. it's not and out it's, of the realm of possibility that people would do that, but at the same time, it's kind of one of these elements of historical detail that would be lost, I think, on the average player. Right. And it's also sandwiched between a bunch of not real stuff. Mm -hmm. Right. Like right below, you know, Viking is the hidden ones. Yes. And the order of the ancients, which are not real things. Um, <laughs> no. So it's what? it's a funny no. sort of like, <laughs> I, I, as far, I mean, they're hidden, so I could be wrong. <laughs> um, it is hilarious, right? Like the assassins as a group. Yeah. Is a midi is a central to later medieval phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Right. So now the game, in order to have the assassins, has turned them into a different. The hidden, they're not called assassins. That's anymore. right. The hidden ones, and yeah. uh, and they're right up against the Vikings and the Saxons, right? right? To real historical groups. And so, if you were really lost in the woods, then you could come away with the sense that oh, the hidden ones. Yeah, that uh, that could have been an actual right. group. Now, I, I would give the average player more credit than that, but you never what know. Else? You never know. Yeah, so the Saxons, uh, and then we've got all the uh, player characters and the NPCs that you come up against. And you get a sense here also of uh, the dress uh, that you see yeah. from these characters. And uh, one of the interesting things uh, that I've enjoyed uh, so far, uh, and there's Harold, um, <clears throat> is uh, the ways in which the game has you kind of playing kingmaker uh, to these Anglo-Saxon uh, lords uh, throughout these different territories and basically having the Danes uh, pick one of these Anglo-Saxon lords to be in charge of a, uh, a kingship, but then also having this uh, kind of uh, deal with the Danes, having a deal with the Vikings to supply them with gold or for, with men in order to keep them in power. Yeah, right. And some of this is based on like real history, like, you know, uh, Alfred and uh, Kjolwolf, I'm, I'm probably pronouncing that wrong because that I'm sounds right yeah. but um right like these are real people um and this idea like that the danes move in and basically and we use danes very broadly mm -hmm. right northmen would probably be a more accurate or norse groups would be a more accurate term because dane of course could mean both people from denmark but also it's just a catch-all term for scandinavians yeah. in this period um, right. Like they actually did. They unseated the King of Mercia and they sort of put in a puppet ruler for a while. Mm -hmm. Um, and they made alliances and they served as mercenaries, right? That's the, the really beautiful complexity of it is like a Viking could just as easily be serving in, you know, serving, um, Alfred as he could be fighting against Alfred mm -hmm. or allying with him against other groups of Vikings, right? Like even on the continent, right? Normandy is literally Northman land. Mm -hmm. right like it's the place where the, we put the northmen and they put them there 
to stop other Northmen. Mm -hmm. Right. And to stop them. Right. It was like, okay, you've been raiding us a lot. How about instead we give you some land on the coast and you serve as a buffer between us and other Northmen. Mm -hmm. That's very typical behavior. Yeah. Right. So there is, there's room for alliances and there's room for intermarriage even and conversion and backstabbing and all this sort of messy stuff. And it's nice that the game sort of gets at that. Yeah. It's not just adversarial. Yes. Yes. Um, all right. Well, I think we've gone uh, over what I originally said, but you know, again, Daniel, <laughs> thank you so, so much. much to say. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for all this historical detail. This helps a lot. And uh, you know, well, maybe we'll have you back on for uh, downloadable content. Uh, yeah. Next I'm year always game. This game. I'm always game to talk about games as it were. Um, <laughs> I spend a lot of time doing this sort of stuff with my students just because it's so, so much fun too. Yeah. So this will yeah. be a great resource for them. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, yeah. until next time, goodbye. <laughs>